you don't need a computer science degree to get a developer job or start a startup. Personally, I found the first two to three years pretty useful, but after that, I had the skills to learn whatever I needed on my own. But the thing that frustrated me the most about school is that professors and textbooks usually overcomplicate things a lot. So this video is my attempt to explain what I learned in my four-year degree in the simplest way I can. A program is just a bunch of instructions that tells the computer to manipulate data in some way. Programmers usually work with data in three different formats. Numbers, text, which are called strings, and true-false values, which are called booleans. We can write code to do operations on this data, for example, adding these two numbers, combining these two strings, or negating this boolean value. When you start programming, You'll usually be writing programs where the instructions are executed sequentially, one instruction at a time. To make a program more useful, you need to be able to store the results of these instructions, and this is why we need variables. Instead of doing operations on values which never change, we want to be able to do operations on values that we computed earlier on in the program. I want to cook this shallot, but before I do that I want to mince it. So my variable is like this bowl where I temporarily store the minced shallot before I cook it. And I can use another variable to store my eggs after I crack them. Now that we have variables, we want to be able to change the outcome of the program depending on the value of these variables. To do this, we can use if statements to check if a certain condition is met before executing the code. For example, if the fridge is open, run the code to turn on the light. Often, we'll want to run a piece of code over and over and over again, until some condition is met. I want to keep slicing bread until I have 4 slices. This is what a loop is for. Using these 5 basic building blocks, data, operations, variables, if statements, and loops, you already have everything you need to write almost any program in the world. It would just be really hard. There are two more concepts we can add to make coding much easier. First are data structures, which let us organize our data in different ways. If each variable only holds one value, this quickly makes the code very difficult to understand. Imagine if I wanted to keep track of all the different food in my fridge, and I needed to define a new variable for each food item. It would just be more convenient if I could store a list of all the food items in a single variable. And that's what arrays are for. The array is the most common data structure, and you're going to use it in almost any program you write. It would also be handy if we could reuse code in my program without having to copy and paste it everywhere, which would be inconvenient and make the code very messy. So we can define a function, which is like a recipe we can reuse every time we want to cook a dish. The function is the core concept behind software design, which tries to answer the question, how do we make our code easy for humans to read and write? Okay, so we've covered the basics of coding. You're now ready to get your first job or build a cool project on your own. These days, CS students usually get their feet wet by building one of three types of programs. Websites, mobile apps, and games. Getting some real-world experience will help you appreciate the second and third year courses, which dive into how a computer works so you know how to write more efficient code. Computers are pretty fast, but there are still many situations where you have to optimize performance. Maybe you're processing a very large data set, like the billions of videos on YouTube. Or maybe you're developing a VR game, and you want to make sure it doesn't start lagging and make the player feel nauseous. Performance is measured in terms of how long it takes the program to run, and how much memory it uses. The runtime depends on how many instructions your program needs to execute, and how fast your CPU is, which is responsible for executing those instructions. Meanwhile, the data in your program is stored in the RAM. You can think about the CPU kind of like your consciousness, which lets you execute all the steps to cook your recipe. The less steps in the recipe, and also the sharper your brain is, the less time it will take to finish cooking. The RAM is like your short-term memory, where you temporarily store the instructions after you read them from the cookbook. Having more RAM won't necessarily make your program run faster, but not having enough will slow it down. It's like what happens when you have too much information to remember and you start to forget things. Of course, computers can't actually store things like food in the RAM. Remember our three basic data types? 
numbers, strings, and booleans. These are also just extra abstractions to help programmers think about data. Memory on your computer is like a bunch of light bulbs that are either on or off. We write 0 to represent the off state and 1 to represent the on state. Every piece of data eventually gets converted into a sequence of zeros and ones. This is called the binary system. The zeros and ones stored in the RAM gets funneled into the CPU, which is made of electronic circuits which can execute some number of specific instructions on the data, and then spit it back out into the RAM. A typical CPU actually only knows a few thousand different instructions, which means that all the code you write eventually has to get converted into some combination of the instructions that the CPU knows how to execute. On top of that, different CPUs use different sets of instructions, so that begs the question, do we have to rewrite our code for every CPU we want to support? We don't, because we have the operating system. The OS is an intermediate layer between your program and the physical hardware. If you wanted to build an Android app, you don't need to rewrite your code for all the different Android devices. You just write it once, and then the OS does the drudge work of converting it into something that works on the specific hardware it's running on. The OS also manages the different programs running on the computer, kind of like the restaurant manager managing the workers. Without a central system to keep track of everything, it would be really hard for different programs to share the system resources and communicate with each other. Many students find the OS course challenging because a modern OS has many different components which interact with each other in complex ways, and it's hard to understand these things by reading a textbook. Fortunately, there are many online resources you can use to supplement or even replace a traditional computer science education. One of these is today's sponsor, Skillshare. So I'm a very practical person. I learn new skills when I need them. I don't want to waste time consuming too much information. When I started making tech videos earlier this year, I had never used a DSLR before, so I spent a few hours watching videography courses on Skillshare. My favorite course was DIY Cinematography, Make Your Video Look Like a Movie by Ryan Booth. He teaches you how to make your videos look cinematic just by manipulating light, and he does this without any technical jargon by just showing you how he sets up the lights for a short documentary video. Now I'm sure a lot of you guys already redeemed your 2 month free trial. But now, you can use another email address and get another 2 months for free by checking out the link in the description. Good entrepreneurs need many skills, so check out Skillshare and learn something new today. Alright, we've covered most of the core CS courses. The rest of your degree is like icing on the cake, where you get introduced to different domains within computer science, which aren't that fundamental and can probably be learned more efficiently over the internet. A common upper year course is the algorithms course, where you'll learn about cookie cutter solutions to common problems like finding the shortest path between two points. Algorithms are important to know because you'll get asked about this if you interview at any tech company, but in real life you rarely need to code these algorithms yourself. One reason for this is because these days, whenever we encounter a hard problem, we just throw machine learning at it. A traditional algorithm is like the recipe that tells us the exact steps to cook eggs on toast, but a machine learning algorithm doesn't require the programmer to specify the exact steps to solve a problem. Instead, we provide data and the computer figures out a good solution on its own. It's like taking a class and learning many different cooking techniques and recipes, and then using that knowledge to figure out how to cook eggs and toast without using a recipe. In order for machine learning to work well, we need to provide a massive dataset, and processing very large datasets on CPUs, which can only execute a few instructions at a time, is very slow. Fortunately, your computer has a dedicated piece of hardware for doing parallel computations, the GPU. GPUs were invented because your monitor has a lot of pixels in it and there needs to be a parallel way to compute the colors and brightness of all these pixels. And this brings us to the field of computer graphics, or CG. This was one of the hardest courses for me because you need a strong foundation in calculus and linear algebra in order to understand concepts such as lighting, physics, and perspective. But it's an interesting course if you're into movies and video games. Yo, my laptop's really slow. Can you fix it for me? Seriously? I have a degree in computer science and you're asking me to fix your laptop?
Well, you're the guy who knows how to use computers. Fine, I'll take a look. You probably just need to reboot it or something. Whoa! Uh, you should bring this to the computer engineering guy. <laughs>